All right, let's take our places. Um, so I understand that the uh, blood strategic form has left the best for last. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, as people still come in, I, I suggest we get started. So welcome to the panel on waterproofing our peace actions and conflict, proof conflict proofing our water actions. Uh, first thing, I'd like to thank the government of Slovenia for including this topic on the agenda and for the great partnership that we've had with uh, Interpeace uh, contributing to the, to the Blood Strategic Forum. It's been a pleasure for us. Uh, let me also start by saying that if you are expecting a call from Prime Minister Golub on helping him define the policy for water in Slovenia, leave your phones on. Otherwise, please turn them off. Yeah? Um, so, let me start, uh, before we jump into the, the main topic on water, just to reflect that when the COVID-19 pandemic struck the world, um, it was first labeled as a health crisis. And very quickly, we all came to recognize it as a multidimensional crisis that affected all aspects of our governance, of our communities, and of our societies. And the response to it had to go f far beyond just a health response. And I don't think that we can say that our response was particularly positive uh, in terms of the, the uh, outcome. Similarly, water is one of those issues that touches all aspects of our lives. And it, uh, it in particular, touches the most important ones that are priorities for populations all around the world, be it health, be it energy, be it food security, the environment, and peace. And, uh, you know, in the groundbreaking uh, report, A Matter of Survival, uh, that was the result of the high-level panel on water and peace that President Turk chaired, uh, the first sentence of the first chapter is, water is life. It is multidimensional, it is all-dimensional. And I, that is one of the big challenges that we're going to be talking about, in fact, to actually prioritizing water in everything that we do. And I'll come back on that. The, the report goes on to say that it is a fundamental condition of human survival and dignity. And for those of you that attended the fantastic event with Slavoj Žižek last night, you'll recall the emphasis that he put on dignity as core to peace. And my own uh, former chairman and mentor, Marti Atasari, uh, would always say that the best way to create an enemy for life is to humiliate them. That the role of peace builders is to, and all our responsibility, is to protect the dignity of the other, uh, to preserve it, to protect it, to promote it. So the issue of dignity, the issue of access to water, uh, is central to our, our ability to live in peaceful societies. So the dimension of peace is that additional one. Now the challenge is that each of the sectors I mentioned, health, environment, uh, food security, etc., they act in a siloed fashion. Uh, so, does, so does the water specialist community, as we're going to hear from some of our colleagues, operates in a fairly siloed fashion, and yet the issues are fully integrated. People don't do a bit of humanitarian in the morning and then a bit of development from 11 to 3 and then some peace building from 3 to 5. It's all integrated in their lives in a natural way. The challenge is that that's not how our institutions function. That's not how our societies function. They're not incentivized to work on integrated solutions. The World Resource Institute estimates that there are 48 ongoing water-related conflicts in the world today, five of which are of a transboundary nature, like the Lake Chad Basin. Um, and most of those conflicts are intrastate, so requiring a focus on national and, and subnational governance, cooperation, inclusion, community uh, uh, cohesion. Um, but there's also a, a, so a sore lack of international legal frameworks, as the report, A Matter of Survival, pointed out, a sore lack of international frameworks to manage and prevent uh, water-related conflicts. Now, two billion people today live in fragile states with weak institutions unable to help manage those uh, subnational water crises. And 40% of the world's population today live in transboundary 
uh, river basins. So this is an issue that we're talking about today that touches a large part of the planet and needs to become a, a greater priority and a more coherent priority. There has been much progress on the policy front. Think of the 2002 uh, inclusion of water in the economic, social, and cultural rights. Think of the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals that have integrated water and the focus on water. The EU Council uh, uh, conclusions on water from 2021 under the Slovene presidency. The 2022 UN General Assembly resolution on the right to the environment uh, that includes water. And of course, the tw March 2023 upcoming UN uh, uh, conference on water. The challenge, however, and this is, I think, the challenge for our panel today, is to manage a polarity that at one end requires us to have a centralized and focused attention on water as a topic, both for investment, for scientific uh, uh, evaluation and, and inquiry, for policymakers, and at the same time, the need to integrate water into everything. It is one of those issues that is quickly lost because it's supposed to be transversal. And we need to basically do both. Keep the eye on both balls at the same time. Make sure it's fully integrated. And at the same time, give it its due space as a topic politically, economically, and in terms of our attention. So to help us to figure out how to adjust our institutions and our societies to better manage that polarity, we have a great panel with us today, starting with President Danilo Turk, former president of Slovenia, of course, the president of the Club of Madrid, the chair of the high-level panel on water and peace, and I'm proud to say a former board member of Interpeace. We have Dr. Catherine Brick Friedman, North American Arctic Policy Advisor at the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security, uh, which is affiliated with the US Department of Defense and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars and a member of the Global, global uh, Diplomacy Lab, which you'll tell us more about. Lieutenant General retired, Emmanuel de Romemont of France, served in the French Air Force until 2015 and currently uh, runs as executive director the More Water for the Sahel Initiative. And Dr. Irina Creed, the executive director of the School of the Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada, and researches amongst many other things, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, probably uh, butcher this, the links between hydrological and biogeochemical processes and their ecological consequences on fresh waters, particularly in communities at risk. So we have a scientist of the highest order, we have a politician of the highest order, we have an academic of this highest order and practitioner, and uh, someone from the security community uh, that is now in civil society and acting on the ground on these issues. And I, as facilitator, will be bringing as well a peace-building perspective to, through my questions to the panel. So we're looking at that interface between conflict and water from multiple angles, but the issue being, why are we so incapable of addressing this in a coherent way? Why are institutions operating in such a siloed fashion, what can we do about it in order to address what needs to be a very integrated uh, approach to, to such topics. In terms of the process that we're going to do today, I'm going to ask questions to the panel um, and then try to stimulate a conversation amongst the panelists. Then we have a first respondent uh, that I'll introduce at the time uh, who will respond to what from the panel and stimulate that further. And then we're going to open up for Q&A with all of you, and I'll do some brief concluding remarks, if that's okay with everybody. So first, let's start uh, perhaps with uh, President Turk. Um, the EU uh, Council conclusions uh, in 2021 on water were a breakthrough, and congratulations again to Slovenia for that leadership. Um, one thing I found particularly uh, concerning uh, that maybe others haven't noticed is that it was, the decision was taken by uh, ministers of development cooperation, not by ministers of foreign affairs or even by prime ministers or, or heads of state, as probably it should have been. And what that did is that relegated the topic to an issue of one, foreign policy, and two, of development cooperation. And yet we know that the issue is something that needs to be a 
cross-governmental priority in most governments, given how much it is far-reaching. How do we elevate the issue of water politically within governments so that it's not relegated to one ministry or another or to something that is about other people's problems? Even Slovenia, a country that's rich in water resources, uh, has been going through the worst water crisis in 35 years. Uh, how is Slovenia even dealing with that as an integrated issue across all governmental efforts? And what can we do to elevate that? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Scott. And uh, let me start by <clears throat> one preliminary remark and one introductory remark. The preliminary remark is this. Uh, this panel has a good gender balance, which, yeah. is, which is positive, which doesn't happen in every panel and doesn't happen uh, often enough. And I think we should appreciate that. And, keep this uh, gender balance aspect uh, as we proceed with our discussions on water in different dimensions through the future of Blade Strategic Forum. Secondly, the introductory remark. Um, I see you mentioned that we should switch off the phones in case if a Prime Minister of Slovenia calls any of us. Actually, I would very much like Prime Minister to call somebody from, uh, from this <laughs> room at this point, because we had, as you just said, a water crisis in the country. And the problem uh, was because of this uh, of lack of integration of water policy. We have a coastal area which was uh, very badly affected by the drought. And of course, that's an area where the population growth was such that it increased the need for water, uh, while the water supply system was old and uh, was not meant to service the kind of population which we currently have. The answer to the problem, uh, the solution of the problem, would require uh, integration of water supply systems uh, you know, throughout at least half of the country or possibly through the whole country of Slovenia, which is not very large. And in order for that to happen, you need to have attention to this problem at the highest levels. Because if you leave this to municipalities to handle things among themselves, you're likely to get into all kinds of problems that will delay decisions. And then, of course, the bureaucracy in the center will always have its own contribution to make to, to ensure that the process takes a longer time. In order to, to, to break that vicious circle, one needs to have political leadership at the highest levels. And for that, we would need the intervention of our prime minister in Slovenia today. And if I was asked by the prime minister what I thought about this, I would say, look, you know, Exercise leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, establish a small team to make sure that these things pro progress. I mean, the, the problem uh, is not of an expert nature because experts have said everything, hydrogeologists have said everything. Everybody that needed to say something said something already. And the problem is political. And that political thing is not related to the party system that we have, but really to the, to the way the government functions in its entire territory. And, and it has to function with regard to water today, because we know that otherwise we are going to have a crisis. And that crisis was actually ended yesterday, um, because the um, uh, kind of ex exercise of the emergency water supplies was ended. And of course, now we go back to normal, because we had some more rain. And you know <laughs> we can barely do it. Now, I'm using this as an example of a problem which is happening in a water-rich place. And which is, of course, much more dramatic in water affected or water stressed areas of the world. Uh, now, and I think the answer is always the same. You have to bring this to the attention of the political center. Uh, that is why our panel on water and peace uh, seven years ago was designed in a way which would allow specialists and politicians to be together and try to figure out what's the way forward. We have this nice principle of integrated water management, which was uh, declared at the level of the United Nations back in 1977. There was a conference on water organized in Mar del Plata in Argentina in 1977, and that proclaimed that principle. Now, that principle is not implemented adequately almost anywhere. Uh, there is always something more to do uh, everywhere in the world. And of course, there are areas where, where the question of water is a question of war and peace. Uh, right now, the UN is in, a, in another phase uh, as a result of a variety of discussions that we have had in the past years, including the one which we uh, stimulated through our 
the panel and our report uh, called the matter of survival. Uh, that has led uh, altogether to a declaration on the water action decade of the United Nations, and in March next year there will be a midterm conference on the subject, and I hope that that will create sufficient visibility and attention among the political leaders, and then uh, help developing things into, the, into a better direction. As far as the UN system is concerned, one of the fundamental features with regard to water is that almost every program, fund, or agencies, agency has to do with water. Everybody has a program on water. But none of them has water as the first priority. So then, of course, that creates a problem of coordination, and that requires additional uh, visibility, additional political attention, and political leadership. And of course, uh, political leadership means different things at different levels. You know, when you talk about a nation state, that's one thing. If you talk about an international organization, it means another thing. And therefore, I think we have to we have to insist on political leadership in all contexts. In the European Union that you mentioned, uh, of course we cannot be satisfied. Uh, I mean, the, president, the, the, the council conclusions are meant to be the highest level of political statement uh, of the European Union, and I expected that to happen at the level of the European Council heads of state or government, and that they would have at least five minutes of discussion about this. Of course, this didn't happen at that level. They have relegated this to development. Mm -hmm. I have talked to people in Brussels on various occasions in the recent past, and I know that as far as the structures of uh, Brussels' uh, decision-making machinery goes, uh, this is basically um, uh, in the sector of development cooperation. Foreign policy aspect or foreign policy bodies are not really engaged. And that, that's, again, a symptom of the same problem that we have at the national level, in a country like Slovenia, at the United Nations, in European Union, everywhere. So that, I think, is the key. And then one last word about um, peace-related issues. Obviously, the problem is, it, and it's worst when water becomes uh, either one of the reasons contributing to political tensions, social disintegration, migrations, and finally, political tension and armed conflict. It never works directly for the conflict, but it works in combination with other factors. And that's usually because of that political um, deficit that, that I have been referring to. Now things are a bit different. Uh, you know, the, the tension is growing because uh, the understanding that the, um, the climate change is producing new dimensions of the same problem is growing. And, and that, that's, that's a new factor which I hope will give political leaders reasons to think and, and act. The latest floods that we, are wit that we have witnessed in, in Pakistan has been a, a one of the wake-up calls, a very, very strong wake-up calls. It has shown water disasters becoming a major problem in the world. Uh, uh, now, um, there is another panel of the United Nations on water disasters, and there is a proposed system of rules on international cooperation in case of water disasters. So this is likely to go higher up in the, in the process of discussion. But none of these things are sufficient for any real change. That change still needs to come, and our panel, I hope, will help us in defining the way forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Indeed, 90% currently of natural disasters are water-related, aren't they? Sure. And yet, it's still not sufficient wake-up call for people to, to put the attention that's needed. Um, if I can shift now to, to Dr. Catherine uh, Friedman. So uh, the president talked about the importance of working across the whole system. Yeah? And, and when he was talking about the integration of the communities and the central government. And, and one of the things in, in peace building that we've recognized is the importance of having what we call a track six approach. That's to work not separately at track one and two and three, track one being political leadership, track two, civil society, track three, communities, but actually working across the three, one plus two plus three in everything that you do, integrating the communities and the civil society and the government together. And that's, I think, what, what President Turk is, is calling for in, in a different way. You have pioneered the creation of toolboxes in order to help policymakers actually integrate communities more effectively into the process of designing solutions to the water challenges. Can you say a little bit about what's at the heart of this toolbox? What, what is it about integrating communities that 
was not happening, that this toolbox will help them to actually be able to achieve. Sure. Well, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah. Is it working? Yes. Okay, great, great. Well, first, thank you, Scott, for um, moderating this panel. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the Blood Strategic Forum for inviting me to speak in the Global Diplomacy Lab for um, facilitating my spot on this, on this panel. So as you suggested, I've been working with a team of experts over the last four or five months. These are people who uh, love their communities, who um, are passionate about peace and passionate about water. These are leaders from all corners of the globe. Uh, at the end of the day, we had 12 different countries represented on our team from four different continents. And we were looking at transboundary water systems, four in particular, um, trying to come up with tools to help diplomats and folks on the ground manage some of these challenges. And, and um, some of the tools were traditional tools that um, diplomats are well aware of, facilitation, dialogue, mediation. But in the process, um, we gained one critical insight. And that if you take away one message from our work or from um, my contributions to this panel, uh, it, it is this, that it is absolutely critical for local stakeholders and local rights holders, not only to be engaged in the conversation, because quite frankly, I think that we've done a pretty decent job of doing that. Right? We have mayors who attend COP sessions. We have um, river basin commissions like the Sava River Basin Commission and the International Joint Commission in my neck of the woods. Reach out to stakeholders, host workshops, listen to them. What we realized is perhaps pushing the envelope a little bit further. And that is to reach track six, as you refer to it. Um, we just I get it, that's great, <laughs> uh, one plus two plus three. Um, we, were, we just simply called it track four, which was connecting one, two, and connecting two mm. and three to um, federal uh, officials, but right. let's, call right. it, let's call it track six for now, just for the sake of argument. You have to, in order, so we were thinking about building that process for connecting them. And again, it's sort of, we realized, well, we kind of have some of, these, some of these ways to connect folks, but we think we have to take this one step further. And this is where process and structure, um, there's an interplay between process and structure because structure institutions, organizations at that level, at that international level, at that nation state level, they set the rules of the game. Right, so in our view, the table needs to be expanded. And by that I mean nation states clearly in the Westphalian system and in our international system um, will always have the power to make decisions, but we are suggesting that stakeholders, rights holders, indigenous folks, um, civil society, subnational governments actually have participatory status in these fora, in these rooms where they are sitting side by side with decision makers, not only coming up with the ideas, but to President Turk's point, helping to think very practically mm -hmm. about implementation. It's our view, the Global Diplomacy Lab and the view of um, the Water Diplomacy Lab that I led, that those folks on the ground are integral to implementation, to not only solving the challenges, but also implementation. And we think that might make a difference. And the one example that I can think of where that actually exists is in the Arctic Council, where indigenous, uh, indigenous actors um, you know, don't merely have observer status. They're not merely consulted, but they have permanent participant status in the Arctic in Council. decisions too? They, they are consulted um, and um, they have a tremendous amount of influence mm. in the final decisions that are made. Now again, nation states, Westphalian system, sovereignty, we all get it, right? Um, but, if, but they are, um, they have a, a, a bit more heft 
I would say, than, than others. And I just wonder if, I wonder if it's a model that might be applied to other entities and other organizations around the world. Now, I understand there are challenges with this, right? Like, so originally, like indigenous peoples were um, part of the creation of, uh, you know, the, the predecessor of the Arctic Council, right? So they've been in the game from the beginning, you know, working side by side with folks. Um, and that isn't the case with some other transboundary regions, right? So it would mean tweaking the institution or the organizational structure, which bureaucracies aren't really um, known <laughs> to do in terms of their flexibility. So I throw that out there as an idea. Um, and uh, as a straw man, um, maybe it would work, maybe not, but I'm interested in everybody else's perspective, understanding it's quite complicated. Right, very good, thank you so much. So um, maybe uh, turning to the general, um, and before we get into your work uh, in the Sahel on water, one of the questions that uh, Tanya Mishkova, uh, the water envoy of Slovenia, uh, was eager for me to ask you was to go a bit back into your experience in the military uh, and including in your engagements in Africa. To what extent was water part of the calculus that the military, the French military, Use not, not only for your own use, but the, the, the role that water played in communities. To what degree was that part of the analysis that the French military used when they engaged in various zones of uh, the continent? Uh, thank you, Scotland. Thank you, President Dirk, for inviting me in Slovenia. And it, uh, there is many uh, things on, 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 the, on your, your question. It's mainly... Uh, the rule is do not arm. This is the main rule. Main rule. So when you have a military deployment, the rules is do not arm and do not impact negatively the population. And this is a rule where French, from an not going classified information, have made progress in knowledge, in terms of knowledge, because before to share a tech decision, the question which is about key, especially about my specialty, which is groundwater is knowledge, sharing knowledge. And, and, and the French have been OK uh, to uh, do an arm and protect and, and uh, um, having gaining information and having sufficient information to not arm. But um, it's not the case for many African military people. It's not the case for many others people, others deployment. And de facto, there is an impact, a negative impact sometimes, for the population. So the rules, number one, what, I, what, I, what I'm, 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 I'm aiming at is it is necessary, and it comes to your point, about putting in place uh, mechanisms where we can share between military, between, between, uh, civ between population, local population, uh, ministry, and, and that is not in place. Right now, and that's something which is, you ask for change, about the question of possibility of change will, will be, this is one of the driver, one, one of leverage you can uh, act and you can act upon. So um, my point, the, 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 the French military arm knowledge, because of, of also, you, you don't share information because of classified, you don't want to see where your camps are, but, but Looking from, and it has been discussed today in many things about a Western attitude. Frankly speaking, what I discovered in using in, in, in learning uh, hydrology and water is that we, if I say the word Western country or Northern country, we have knowledge and we add the knowledge, a very good knowledge about Africa. But because of lack of money, we, <laughs> we get rid, we, we are let. And the problem is, I don't. There is possibility to provide this knowledge to this population, and this is the key. Uh, there are, this is where where there is a possibility. And you st st spoke about called about silos, about stovepipes, about things, and it's just where yeah. I think, from my point of view, just to finish that on that, I think a little bit absurd. Or sort of, uh, if you look at the system from from a different angle, and where I, I went from different worlds, peace and. 
I, I see people not talking to each other, development, humanitarian, military, uh, local things. And, uh, and this is where I think there is a m room for, for a lot of progress. Thank you. And, and uh, I want to come back to you um, after I uh, take a few more questions uh, with the colleagues about the issue you raised in one of our previous conversations around the mindset shift that's needed. Uh, so if you can prepare for that. Uh, but maybe to build on that, uh, Irina, the, so the French military, like any very capable institution, has a lot of knowledge that it uh, can, it, whether it does or not is another matter, but it can share with local communities that it was, we heard from uh, uh, Catherine, needs to be involved in the process of uh, joint solutions with uh, national governments. Daniel, uh, President Turks made the same point. Um, but the scientific community has the ability to model, to create a lot of that knowledge, to generate um, the evidence and to visualize these very complex systems in ways that actors who are, take the military as an example, take peace builders as another, often don't have the time to go and gather that information, to be able to, and communities have even less access to that knowledge, and they're the ones who should have it first and foremost. What is the challenge of actually being able to serve up the, the deep knowledge that someone like you has in a manner that communities can actually use and be empowered by? It seems to be one of the gaps in our ability across that, or whatever number of tracks we talk about, uh, uh, ensuring the agency of actors at the various levels to be effective at the bigger question. So what is the scientific community's um, or rather, what insights can you share as to how to make that translation, that accessibility um, of knowledge effective so that the actors are all capable of playing the role that they need to play? Well, thank you so much for that question. And I do want to build on your, thank you, um, observation of President Turk's comment that when he first started speaking, he talked about the fact that we know everything and now we really, it's a really a political problem. But then he added the subsequent co comment, which was climate change is setting new rules. Mm -hmm. And so even within the scientific community, we don't have a static message. It's an evolving message. And just to talk about what's happened since the onset of the Anthropocene, which some of you may know is it started around 1963, according to scientists. But that has set a trajectory for so much uncertainty and complexity in the change of the water cycle moving forward. I want to give you two examples of some of the research that I have most recently focused on. One of them is the idea of the intensification of the water cycle. What that means for communities is that wet areas are becoming wetter and dry areas are becoming drier. Mm. The second idea is what we call a homogenization of the water cycle. And what that means is that where you used to have some kind of variability and, and resilience, that is disappearing and the water cycle is becoming less resistant to these changes. My concern as a scientist is that we have focused on things that we see. We look at the su surface waters, we look at bled, the beautiful lake, we understand precipitation. The narrative is changing to start focusing on what are the issues that we don't see. Emmanuel talked about the groundwater resources. I don't know if there's a map that can be shown at this point, but if, if we could, okay. it would have shown you a global map that we have now been able to use satellites to track the depletion of groundwater resources over the whole planet. And what we've seen is, is, is frightening, that areas of conflict or areas where there might be conflict are getting redder and redder, meaning lower and lower groundwater resources. Yeah. Other areas, it's increasing. We're do you talk about the power of rules and the rules of power. The rules of the game are changing in terms of water on the planet. The other thing is, is that the unseen water that is in the atmosphere. Some of you may have heard of the, the t um, term atmospheric rivers. It sounds beautiful. But think about what's happening in Pakistan right now. Atmospheric rivers are orig originating from the melting Arctic, which puts Water vapor <clears throat> into the atmosphere goes across many different nations, dumps a bunch of water, intensifies the monsoons, and now you have a thousand people dead and potentially millions displaced. 
that is going to have consequences for migration. That is going to have consequences for everyone on the planet. Another example of atmospheric rivers is where you look at forests. We've talked a lot about carbon. We talked about greenhouse gases at this meeting. We talked about energy and fossil fuels and exasperating um, the, the, the global warming. Some of our strategies to mitigate that is to plant trees. We're talking about t trillion tree challenges that are going to be planting trees across large swaths of land. But that forest, which takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, has consequences for water. And it also will transpire water, move water from the roots up into the atmosphere and connect to other places. We've been in the, you know, before many of these changes have occurred, let's just think that there was a steady state. It became predictable where those atmospheric rivers came from and where they supplied water. But now that we're re-changing the whole landscape, we're introducing again some unpredictability, some uncertainty of what we've become complacent with in terms of how much water we get in any area. So that's the doom part of the message. The good news part of the message is I think that I'm here at this meeting. I'm a scientist surrounded by politicians. There are many others like me that want to be part of this conversation. Mm. We want to get in a room. We want to share our science. We don't want to make it complex. We don't want to make it the models, the big data. Yes, we do need to work on the artificial intelligence. President Turk talked about that earlier. But leave that to the scientists. What we need to hear is from the diplomats and the politicians, what, what are your concerns? How do you make decisions? What information do you need? And together, we can come together and elevate, harness the power of what we're calling water intelligence, both within the scientific community, both within the diplomatic community, and of course, the bridge that ties both. Well, I can say as a peace builder working uh, in over 20 different contexts, conflict contexts around the world, the lack of, of accessibility of simple tools, not text-based, so visual-based, uh, but pedagogical tools that communities can use to get that water intelligence you're talking about as they are living it, is missing. Is missing. I think we, we, there is a gap. Is that there's a, you know, we are 300 meters from the IPCC, um, yet we are not able to, to translate their knowledge into usable tools that in northern Kenya, for example, in Mandera County, uh, an area we work, northern Kenya, southern Somalia, eastern Ethiopia, it's the second most dangerous place in the world for a woman to have a child, because only 2% of the population is running water. Their ability to find solutions to water issues are deeply political, uh, cultural, uh, they, they, but if you, you can't come and give a solution to them, they have to want the solution, they have to own the solution. That means equipping them with the knowledge that allows them to then make those decisions. And that's what we're lacking in terms of the tools. And I think, if I may perhaps be a little provocative, is that the local people know a lot more about the water than we give them credit for. And further, totally. that we're not in the position to give tools. We need to co-create tools. We need to co-produce knowledge. And that shows a sign of respect, of recognition to those that are impacted the most. But I also don't want the narrative to be a focus on what the community needs, at the, the people to people. We also need tools to inform subnational governments. Sure. We also need tools. I, I think that mm -hmm. everybody, whether you are a president or whether you are a young person in this room, should take a course on climate and the implications of climate change on water. Because once we have that type of knowledge across all realms, whether it's science, diplomacy, political, community, we can then really start to affect that change. Thank you. President Turk, uh, given the political experience that you've had, one thing that strikes me as necessary <clears throat> is also to be able to craft a narrative that can mobilize public opinion to recognize the central importance of this. And now you've been at this for some time. You've put out uh, reports and made speeches, et cetera, that say all the right things. But what is going to, what kind of communications or narrative creation processes are needed to be able to stimulate a sense of action in people, not just 
recognizing the problem and leaning back, but actually leaning forward and saying, oh, I, n I not only understand, but I need to do something about it. Well, first of all, I, I can't claim much success in this area. And therefore, you know, I can't give a, an, um, uh, an advice based on my own experience of mobilization of people. I, mean, I can't say that. But what I can see is uh, two things which are interrelated. First, uh, fear. I think fear is a very important mobilizing factor. And now in Europe, if you think about the drought which we had, which was the, the, the most serious drought in 500 years, and uh, you know the, the, the levels of uh, rivers have gone so low that uh, stones were discovered at which there are signs how that affected, uh, created famine 500 years ago and so forth. So I mean, these are the kind of things which people will care about. And one has to work with that piece of information if you are a politician in Europe. I mean, I'm talking about Europe. Of course, there are other things that have to be done in other places. I read uh, stories uh, recently about the floods in China, in the Chongqing area, and the uh, middle Yangtze River. I wonder what would work there. I mean, that was, a, that was an area of very intense water management process uh, for the last few decades. And of course, right, right now, they had to resettle 60,000 people because of the ongoing floods or the floods that are now beginning. I mean, they may be much worse in the, in the near future. So I think the, the factor of people, people do care about this. And, and I think that politicians have to understand the seriousness of fear. Now, in Slovenia, I think we have to understand the seriousness of concern that exists with regard to the water in our coastal region. That can be easily forgotten if you have more rain in, uh, in the coming months. And then, of course, people will forget it until the next uh, problem. Uh, but I think the political leaders have to understand that concern is sufficiently strong now to start some kind of a bold program. Now, again, these are the kind of examples I can think about. But that's only part of the story. The other part is the question you know, to understand that the future is not likely to be a continuation of the past. <laughs> yeah. And that, I think, is very important for, for politicians to figure out. The future is not going to be simply a continuation of the past. So the problems may be actually different and larger in the future. And one has to use the tools that exist, which may not produce perfect results as yet, to the best possible effect. Now, that can be done quite easily in a place like Slovenia, where we have plenty of information and expertise and great people who can do all the necessary work. But this can also be done at the global level. I mean, at the global level, I have been involved in discussions in the World Meteorological Organization, which have been pleading for an integrated UN-based information system which would integrate uh, everything that exists nowadays. That's technically doable, but it is not done. People at the UN like to complain about silo mentality and so forth. Now, here they have a perfect opportunity to say, OK, here we can go beyond the silo mentality. We know that such an integrated global system is needed. We have tools. We talk about networking as a future of multilateralism, network multilateralism. Now, that practically means integrate everybody within the system and integrate network them with everybody around the world, use every information that is available, and also see how best to use the artificial intelligence-based tools to understand the changing of the water cycle better and then design answers to the problems that are likely to arise. Now, you know, these are the kind of things a politician can conclude. Now, how to do it? Well, uh, I think there are opportunities. There will be a midterm review of water action decade in March next year. OK, what is being done by the UN agencies like uh, WMO, UNESCO, FAO, and others, each of which has great knowledge in this area, and each of which should be interested in developing such an integrated system at the level of the UN as a whole? For the EU, on the other hand, I think they have to think, uh, you know, the EU is very heavily, div heavily, how should I say, normative um, uh, or system. I mean, they, they, they have uh, plenty of norms relating to water management. There is no shortage of that. But I mean, the current situation requires an additional attention. And I think politicians should be wise enough to, to understand that this is the need of the time, the, of the need of our moment in time. 
and, and their challenge is to make that uh, longer term uh, priority a short term political win yeah. for them, right? Uh, otherwise, they won't be incentivized to do so. It's part of the challenge. That's where fear can be a, a powerful factor. But uh, President Turk was talking about uh, how the institutions uh, are currently functioning, the UN, EU, et cetera. One of our, our joint former colleagues, you, you'll remember Alvaro de Soto in mm -hmm. the UN, had a wonderful saying about the UN, and I say that as a former UN staff member. Uh, but he said that in the UN, no wheel shall go unreinvented. <laughs> Uh, and in that context, we, we, we do see the, the, the incentives of this siloed institutional behavior as something that perpetuates the, the, the status quo. We're going to get to the mentality mindset issue. But uh, Catherine, you and I talked uh, on the phone the other day about the need, the opportunity of this unique moment to actually rethink our institutions, to see how can they be more reflective of the values upon which they were supposed to be founded, uh, reflective of the future uh, that we can already start to see thanks to our scientific community, even if communities are only living the day-to-day -day consequences, we can anticipate. But our institutions are not adaptive, they're not anticipatory. Uh, what kinds of changes do you see in that system as necessary to be able to be more anticipatory and to work in this more networked fashion that the President was talking about? Well. <clears throat> I think in order to achieve President Turk's vision, um, we, how can I say this diplomatically? Uh, I'm not sure that our current international institutions are equipped to deal with the challenges that we are facing. Um, again, we are functioning in, insti we are, are living in a world uh, with global institutions that functioned quite well from 1945, say, or 1950 until roughly maybe the 1980s, right? Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, maybe some people still think they're functioning well now. Uh, I've heard, uh, I said prior, prior to 2016, I looked out into the world and saw our institutions under stress. Um, now, I, I think I see them crumbling, and other people have very boldly said they're dead. Our, the the post-Cold War world is dead. Now, whether or not <laughs> it's dead, crumbling, under stress, I, I guess, uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of degree. My point is this. We are living in a very unique historical time period where we have the opportunity to recreate, to co-create these global institutions in a way that serve the interests and the values that we've been discussing. And when I, when I say that, you know, some of, you know, some of my colleagues are like, well, what do you mean? You know, what, what do you, that sounds really kind of out there. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And I just, I just ask them, who created? Who created? the post-World War II institutions. Who? People, right? People. <laughs> I, I mean, some, sometimes it's as simple as that. And, and maybe we are still in this transition. Maybe what I'm proposing is you know, still a few years out, five years, 10 years. I do know this. I do know that in times of tremendous change and stress. It is human instinct to go back, mm -hmm. to, to grasp onto what we know and try to make it work. And maybe that's why a lot of these ideas and a lot of the solutions aren't being implemented, aren't being implemented and are not implementable because the whole system is shifting and we, we, we need new structures, new organizations, new processes. And I'm not suggesting, you know, that the United Nations, <laughs> you know, is, is going out of business. I, I said this the other day, some of you heard me. I'm not suggesting that, you know, I work in the Canada-US context. My colleagues in Ottawa and Washington, uh, my diplomatic colleagues are going out of business. I'm not putting them out of a job, but I'm just wondering if, 
we need to retweak it, right? If we need to revisit our principles and norms. Hold up that mirror. Are these the principles and norms that we want? OK. Yes, no. Um, if we do, then how do we devise the rules of the game and the decision-making procedures in a better way to really meet those principles and norms? If, those, if the post-World War II principles and norms aren't what we want, I don't know. That's a little bit above my pay grade <laughs> uh, you know, to make these decisions. But if they're not what we want, then let's create new rules and decision-making procedures that reflect and reinforce those principles and norms. Mm -hmm. I, I just think we're living in this really great, unique time period that, yes, it's extraordinarily challenging. And you've heard folks, leaders and others, talk about the challenges that we're facing. But if we view that as an opportunity, I think, I, I, I just think there's hope. I really do. Fantastic. That's going to require a mindset shift of uh, leaders and communities. We heard Irina talk about how everyone should go through a mandatory course on climate change and the role of water. I think one of the things about water as well is, is like the wider question of climate change, is that it's so existential that it should be one of those factors that is one, unifying, and two, has the shock factor, the fear factor that the president was talking about, that is sufficient to get people focused on this and thinking about what our, basically our survival. Like it's, it's past uh, five minutes to midnight. We're mm -hmm. midnight struck, and we're now uh, facing the, the catastrophe. How are we going to uh, save ourselves? So what, how do we get this mindset shift, uh, General? And then we're going to hear from our first uh, I could not agree more as my, my colleague on, on, on Catherine, because uh, uh, first, I want to point out some points about what are the challenge. First, it, the challenge, I call that glocal, to say you need to globalize, because the things about water is mainly local solution, but they requires a global approach. And this is a bad key. Second, long-term strategy. I heard uh, Prime Minister Blair saying, I want to ask for vision, long-term strategy, and planning. Water is key. And water infrastructure, it takes time. Romans, if you look at Swiss, I cross Swiss by, by foot, by, and I, I walk, and I've seen all the, the, the irrigation in Switzerland as may have been by people from Egypt, from Tib, Tib, they bring things, middle, you know, Moyen Montagne, all the water system, which is, which is uh, so it takes, it takes time if you look in Provence, and every people agree that no politician today is able to decide on a 20 or 25 years time, 30 years time frame, and it should be necessary. So the question of investing. And where, where I disagree with, President, with Prime Minister Blair, say you need to pull change makers. We are thinking we're change makers with politicians. I am arguing that something is missing is strategy, is put real strategies. You have the politician, they need to decide, they need to be aware, but you need people to have water strategy solution. Why I think uh, sincerely um, uh, that, that, that putting education uh, is what I call water leaders, but not only water leaders, you have especially, but leaders on water. Have, uh, put people like here. We, we can make a session, a workshop of people from different world and, and having different world. They can communicate. I spoke in my preliminary remarks about military people. But it's very, it's could, military officers could be um, teach upon, upon they, they need to be known about water. So I, I went to university, I'm the only one, the French of French and all knowing about water. And I think it's just, uh, you need to take care. If you plan something, so people from Nigeria, from Chad, from everywhere, so they sh should be aware. We can put processes, we can put, and I think the key thing is where I think from to, uh, see, it's a question about changing the way we process, and I fully agree on the way we cooperate. We cooperate together, and I think very some words which are not relevant anymore. Development, humanitarian, everything is separated. So we need to reconnect, put people at the table, and it's where, it, as an experience, as a military man, I, I am. I'm a change maker. We go for uh, for one year in operation. We have an end state. So what I'm asking here: What is your end state? 
regarding water. We need, yes, the future is uncertain. I heard today many things about the future of EU, but what do you want? I mean, if you, if you want nothing, you have no chance to have something. So we can have solution unless the condition is to be at the table. And it's where the role of the politicians is to put people at the table. And that's put people at the table, force them, education. In one week, we can train people, raise awareness, and, and, and having people with process and, and, uh, and everything. By example, regarding database, and I think I was surprised, I discovered a lot of database on the currency, but they're not harmonized. We use aquifers between boundary, trust boundary. It's not the same. So in some areas, is 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 depletion of aquifers. We don't know the resources, so and I don't know why scientists could not model uh, the same way Africa, what the same way we have done for Paris area, all the Paris model, and that, and now we realize. And I think that I follow President Tur is. Uh, fear now because we realize in France we are lacking water as people say, oh, yeah, now we have uh, things we should be interested. That's a thing. Or maybe there will be a, a time to, uh, to do it. And just to, to, um, yeah, to finish now, I think some people told me, I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I, I spoke about some ideas of a level, but blockchain could be a good idea to put, to put transparency. Because of like wiki waters, put, uh, you know, put, uh, groundwater information, the more you share knowledge. Right now, if you look frankly from a pure institutional perspective about database, if you think about the Office de Sahara, du Sahara Security in Sahara, uh, in Sahel, they're not sharing. They're not allowed to share, <laughs> share knowledge. So that's something which is absurd, totally absurd, just in a way. And I think if you look from pure international, so the, the thing is that it should be impetus at international level, regional level, political level, national level, sub-regional and local. So we need to reorganize things. And, uh, and, and just to, yep. to, fin to finish, on, I have trained for, in French for politicians, one thing about, and I've organized a workshop session. And the purpose was to think about long-term strategy. No one has, think, uh, has been thinking about it's not in the mindset to finish. The question is in the mindset. Uh, uh, and don't tell me it's not possible. It is possible. It's a hope where I think everyone in the room, it's just a question of being trained to agility to integrate all the factors. It's where I think mm -hmm. changing mindset is possible as long as you accept that the time is converging, it's time to, it, it, it's, it's complexity, it's complex. Water is complex, but, but it's an advantage, it's pure. It's not, <laughs> right now it's sort of uh, uh, virgin. It's sort of, so I think it could be a very good example of comprehensive approach which could succeed. And I think it could, it could my mind, succeed. Thank you, General. Well, we're going to hear from our first respondent who's going to comment on what she has heard, and that's Ambassador Inga Rhonda King, who is the permanent representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the UN in New York, and was the president, amongst many other things, those are too long to list, president of the 74th ECOSOC that made major advancements on the importance of environment and water. Uh, Ambassador King, the microphone there, if you could just comment on it, and uh, please prepare any questions you might have for the panel, and we'll then take final responses. Well, first of all, uh, is it working? Yes, first of all, let me, um thank the panelists. It was exciting listening to the, how enthusiastic you are about this issue and um, an existential issue. So thank you for your um, contribution to the discussion. Now we started with hearing from the politician amongst you, um, um, President um, Turk, and he said that the problem is a political one. Then we heard that um, the integrated um, waterproofing um, at the waterproofing or waterproofing principles, or is it, um, of the United Nations has not been implemented. That water is always, and this is an interesting um, formulation by, by President Turk. Water is always on the agenda somewhere, but never a priority anywhere. So that's some food for thought, and I will put some questions around that. 
Now, we learned from various members of the panels that their toolboxes have been created, but to achieve um, action, they need to be better integrated. We heard um, critical messages from must... A critical message was local stakeholders must be engaged in the conversation, but recognizing structure and process, the table must, they must be included um, at the table. So it's not just the, we must engage with them, but they must be at the decision-making table. So because right now we go out, we have interviews, but they're not at the point of um, decision-making. We, we also heard that, um, well, the importance of knowledge sharing between the military and civilian is, is, is a critical thing, and it goes back to the, the issue of, of um, um, conversing, opening up the dialogue to beyond politicians. Now, um, climate change, we heard today, is setting new, um, new rules. Wet areas are becoming wetter, um, and there has been a depletion of ground um, water resources. The atmosphere, we, we see what we call atmospheric um, rivers, the devastation we just recently illustrated in Pakistan. Now, I mean, the discussions were really very rich. I'm just picking out some of the sound bites because I think there's much. To, to dig in further. Um, but the key thing when um, President Turk says the role for the, um, um, the institution of the United Nations, that was challenged. And I think that's one of the big um, issues at the table. You challenged whether the current institutions can do the job. Of course, you countered that by um, saying we need better processes, and you you um, you identified blockchain chain approaches. So I am the question that I'm asking: if the issue is political in nature, the UN was created not by people but by politicians, actually, not not by people. So if we are to to create a new institution, or to modify the current one, what might that look like to you? Because we have real difficulty at the United Nations to, in to include civil society. Mm -hmm. Europe is far, much farther along in including civil society in discussions. In the South, less so. So is it that we reform this because we are in perpetual state of reforming the United Nations? Is it, or do we start from scratch? Our colleague here would not agree with that. But what might that look like, the, a new institution? The new rules, what might they look like? The new institution, what might it look like? And I want to put a big question on the table. We have, we didn't touch on the conflict proofing of our walk, what, water actions necessarily. I, I heard a lot of waterproofing our peace actions. Well, perhaps, perhaps we touched on both, but, but the GERD is a huge problem today. Um, the great um, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. If we are to look at that, we have, on the one hand, Egypt, it's the, the, the Nile supplies 97% of Egypt's water. And at the same time, Ethiopia needs the, the dam for hydroelectricity. So what we have is not just a water problem, but water for energy. So we have water for life but water also for energy. We haven't touched on that, and I'm curious to hear. If we were to back up, because it's a huge political problem now, but if we look at the, that problem, how might we have been better prepared to treat with 
such a problem if we, in hindsight, so that we can think of the because we have the issue of repairing um, repa repairing um, mm -hmm. states, and the so to touch on that issue and the GERD in hindsight, what might the system have had in place to treat with and to to circumvent where we are now because it's a huge problem and one that can, you know, lead to war. So yeah. with that, I. Um, Hand over. Thank, Thank you, you, Ambassador. I just want to see, are there any other hands that are going up from members of the audience? Just don't, I want to give everyone a chance. No? Okay. Well, that was a big enough <laughs> challenge to chew on. Uh, so perhaps President Turk. Yes, well, the issue of the Nile was raised and the issue of the United Nations. So I think that that's for politicians to comment. And let me s offer a few comments in a telegraphic sense because we don't have much time. Now, first, the problem of the Nile is much older than the issue of the United Nations. I mean, you know, Herodotus wrote about Nile, Egypt being the gift of the Nile. I discussed this with President Sisi some years ago. And, and, you know, he told me that he was always extremely concerned uh, to put anything about the Nile in public because that creates, creates such an emotional reaction in the general public of Egypt. Even if he wanted to work for a compromise in a most rational and, you know, expert-proof um, fashion. Uh, now, what we have seen is now the Ethiopians filling the reservoir, and this is going on. There is some noise around that, some protesting, but so far, actually, nothing terrible happened. Uh, the, 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 the rainy periods were just about adequate, and nature seems to be working in a way which diminishes the conflictual cap cap capacity for conflict in that area. Now, this, of course, has nothing to do with wisdom of diplomats. Because, you see, all the major powers tried to play uh, a role in this matter. I mean, President Trump invited Ethiopians and Egyptians, and Ethiopians didn't comply with what Trump wanted from them. So he, in his usual fashion, suggested that they should be deprived of uh, development assistance, which Ethiopians took rather stoically, I think. Uh, President Putin invited them to Sochi and talked about that because he wants to raise Russia to global status. Uh, nothing much happened there. The Security Council was engaged, had two discussions, and nothing happened there because nobody really wanted to deal with this issue. Uh, so they left it to the African Union. You know, African problems uh, have to have African solutions. And that's a very convenient thing to say when you don't have a solution. Now, that's what happened there. Now, nature is helping in a, in a sense uh, which was not predicted, but it can be helpful. Now, what I think could be done now politically is to figure out with Ethiopians in a very discreet manner whether they would be willing to make a goodwill gesture to say, look, I mean, we have traditionally said that we don't want unreasonable use of water. We don't want to affect badly the uh, low riparian countries, Sudan and Egypt. Uh, and please trust us. We are not going to do anything really very bad to you. And here is what we propose. I mean, there are technical proposals that can be worked out. But I think politically, that's now for Ethiopia as an opportunity. That's my you know, quasi-optimistic look. And I know when African Union was chaired by uh, South Africa, they tried. They had meetings, and mm -hmm. nothing much happened there. Now it's the Senegalese presidency. Nothing really much is happening. You know, Senegalese are very serious and reasonable, rational people. They're not going to experiment too much. Uh, but I think that Ethiopia as Ethiopia has an opportunity to make a gesture. What that would be, I would leave to, to them. Uh, secondly, on the future of the United Nations, clearly, you know, UN has been in crisis and in the need for reforms ever since 1947 or so. Uh, I, I once met a senior official who passed now already and said, you know, I remember uh, yeah, UN was declared dead in 1947 at the time of the Iran crisis, and that has happened periodically. Now, UN was not established by the people, although President Roosevelt had a good reason to, to claim that. 
And I, I, as, a, as a scholar, I looked at the records of what was happening in 1945 when President Truman, successor of President Roosevelt, traveled in the United States and made speeches about the great future that the United Nations will bring. It was genuinely felt by the people, and Truman, as a politician, knew that, and he had a message, and the message was United Nations. That was 1945, as we can learn from the documents. Uh, we don't see anything remotely similar to that today. And I wonder what that other thing would be. You know, Rhonda, I don't have a good answer for that. Nobody has. Uh, and I don't envy the current Secretary General who is consistently asked to provide ideas. Uh, networking is a way of addressing this, but networking has to be developed in, a, in ways which we are not familiar with as yet. It can be an empty slogan if it is not given proper substance. It can be unduly technical thing. It can be politically dubious thing if it is uh, not uh, approached in the right manner. So we don't know. But I think that networking would be a good way to start. Now, what do you add as the real content of networking remains a mystery. And that, I think, is a problem for the United Nations, for politicians, and for civil society. Thank you, President. So we're going to uh, have brief remarks from the other panelists and then wrap up because we're out of time. But just to say, um, uh, Catherine, in um, my own very mini response to the ambassador, there are positive examples of institutions that have been created of late that reflect a little bit what you were talking about, a new, the need for a new form of governance that is much more, right? An example of that in Geneva, partners and, and, and neighbors of ours is Gavi the Global Alliance for Vaccination and Immunization, to tackle a complex, multidimensional problem, which turned out to be a, of global, global significance uh, in the last pandemic, but of course it was created before that, where the governance system has individuals, uh, civil society, uh, business, governments. It, it has a deliberately designed, multifaceted governance system to reflect the various constituencies. Not enough local communities, uh, but still, it's an attempt at creative governance systems to tackle a global integrated problem. It should inspire us to go even further next time, but perhaps you can respond to the ambassador and. Uh, sure. Oh. Uh, certainly, well, very quickly, that's a great, that's a great example. Um, so I'm, I'm quite good at asking provocative questions. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, um, like President Turk, I, I don't have a definitive answer, but I will tell you this, I did think about well, what would this look like? So I'm saying, have to engage local folks at the you know federal level. You need to engage them in this, in this process and in these structures. What would they that look like? And so I, I thought I would just look at um, a local example. Uh, again, I I just quickly looked at the Sava River Commission. I'm like, okay, groundwater. Um, we heard that uh, it, it is sustainable for 400 years, but that projection may not be accurate given um, these climate change projections and, and all of these scenarios that I, Irene's colleagues have, have constructed. So then I was like, okay. So I looked at the Sava River Basin Commission and there, I looked on their website and there are 30 different national organizations, organizations within Slovenia that are related to the commission's work. Then I looked, then there was, it, it was actually laid out quite nicely. Then there were international institutions that are related to or engaged in that work. And you know, there was of course the UN Economic Commission for Europe, but then four directorate generals, right? And then there were a couple of other organ, international organizations mm -hmm. sprinkled in there, which demonstrates President Turk's point <laughs> about how complex and, um, diffuse water is. And so I don't have an answer for you. However, I, I would just suggest, I mean, if, if the question is important enough, and again, maybe this is premature, maybe this is a question for five or 10 years down the road, but any number of organizations could certainly pull together a bunch of bright people in a room to kind of figure this out, right? Like, what, what is it? Is it? Um, and I'm not. I'm not a radicalist. I'm not. I'm not a revolutionary where I think the UN should come down, right? I mean, maybe it can be tweaked. Maybe not. Maybe we can leverage networks in a way that more um, better complement the institutions. 
Um, and, and again, in, in the North American context, highly decentralized. We have institutions and right. networks side by side. So, so maybe, maybe you know, that's the next step because we do know that when that policy window opens, when that window of opportunity opens, and politicians, not people, need answers, the first things their staffers are going to do is look to see what, what, exists. <laughs> what report exists to give them ideas to you know, give them the answers quickly. It so sounds like the topic for a session at the next Blood Strategic Forum ah, to, yes. present, to present the results of there a process go. of answering that question between now and then. Does that sound right? Nice. We'll tell uh, Peter. Perfect. To, to plan for that. OK, I'm sorry. We have one, one minute, General. One minute, Irina. OK, one minute. Just a free answer, Your Excellency, to, to your question. First, work on territorial resilience. Center on what? Territorial resilience. I think if work, when I can send you a paper I've done for the World Bank saying about integrated territorial resilience and thinking from UN all the to all level. Second, and this is. Um, uh, about what we, was in the topic of this uh, is the term of peace operation. Being a military, I am a skeptic about things. So I say it's a reason why I should I suggest to add water and peace operation or environment and peace operation, which have different finality. And this is will force people to combine, like uh, Australia have done that one time, sort of people forcing to integration. And I have. Uh, been thinking a lot about that, and I can, I can, uh, I can extend more. So again, because peace operation, this is focused mainly run by military and water environment, and some of the people su suggested that there should be rangers uh, taking care of that. And, and third is education. Education, educate people are going to UN to water uh, things uh, issues, but w people working with you and, and people working on water. And if we can share in uh, yep. one week, it's enough. So it was one minute, so thank you. So. Thank you. All Are right, enough? well, <laughs> save the best for last, maybe, I don't know. But we had this thought that happened in our global water diplomacy and we thought of it as a joke and now I'm thinking it could be a really great idea. A global water intelligence agency. I think it has to be nimble, flexible, agile. Sorry, Kate, but waiting five to 10 years is too long. <laughs> Trying to change structures like the United Nations, I'm sorry, President Turk, that just weighs too heavy on me. Just like dealing with the pandemic, something nimble, agile, a global water intelligence agency. How do you connect that global to local? Let's look at model communities. Let's get you know, representative of different kind of regions, those where the wet areas are becoming wetter, those where the dry areas are becoming drier and have them feed up to support this kind of, and, and contribute and co-produce knowledge with the Global Water Intelligence Agency. And just two comments. One, your, the example that you gave in Ethiopia, you asked, I think you asked, if I recall, that there was a, tr um, a conflict of aspirations for, the, for that whole system and that we needed to be integrated. Rule number one is we need systems approach thinking. We need systems thinking, which is integrated yes. thinking. Yes. But rule number two is we have to look at risk and we need to manage risks. And much of the work that we're doing now in water is about managing risks. And um, related to that is you identify where the opportunities are because there will always be opportunities, but you also identify the uh, vulnerabilities. And taking a risk management lens to the conversation and a strategic lens that I think Emmanuel spoke about might be a way of having countries that are in conflict come together because they know that they may give in one area but might receive in another. So that would be my reply Thank you. to you. Thank you so much. I know we're a little bit over time. I was not very, I'm not Swiss, so I can't claim to try to act like a Swiss in terms of Titan keeping. Uh, but just to say on this uh, point, uh, by better analyzing and quantifying risk, you can also price it. Yes. If you can price risk, you can get the private sector involved because they understand cost they understand the opportunity of profit, of course. And, but if you can't price risk, it's very difficult for them to engage and to see how to invest in such solutions. And that's part of the answer, I think, is, to, is that risk. I, w I had a whole series of things I was going to try to conclude. I think we're over time. Uh, can I just say that um, to pick up on your question about how much have we conflict-proofed water, and as a peace builder, what I can tell you is that everything that we try to do, be it in health, be it in in, in all sorts of thematic issues, constitution making, et cetera, at the core of it all is trust. 
Yeah. At the core of it all is trust. And so our contribution as a community to the answers, the, to the questions that we're trying to tackle, is not to come up with the better science that we have scientists to do. It's not to tell a politician how to you know, create a narrative for their population. That's their job, et cetera, et cetera. But it is to look at the relationships that are necessary between different actors, communities, within communities. Their ability, if they can't trust one another, they can't work together to solve anything be it uh, uh, re you know, recover from a disaster or plan their own security. Uh, but so the issue of trust is critical. And that's what we're seeing in the health sector, is that by doing peace-building interventions, we're creating the conditions for health interventions to become possible that were not otherwise possible before. And I can, you know, another time I could give you many examples. Of that. But that's going to be our contribution, I think, is to look at the complex system, as, the, as Irina is rightly saying, it's a complex system of actors. Uh, as we heard from Catherine, they are actors who are incentivized not to work well together <laughs> currently in the way that they're structured. Um, they don't have the right mindset, and they certainly don't know how to uh, make this positively political. They're, they've made it, the, po the political angle has been about me, 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 sovereignty, sovereignty, not our shared interests. So the role of peace builders in that is to figure out how to change and improve those relationships so they become win-wins, not confrontational ones. So that's, uh, as a parting word, the issue of trust, I think. And what we've seen with the pandemic is that there's been a massive erosion of trust globally uh, and trust in institutions. So there's, so, uh, and then just a last word and a plea, perhaps, uh, maybe President Turk, you could support us in this, is that I've, it's become clear to me uh, through talks with some of the officials involved that the UN Water Conference, co-hosted by the Dutch and the Tajiks, is going to avoid actually uh, some of the political issues around water and conflict and peace. Uh, the, the, one of those two hosts is eager to keep that issue off the agenda. And so I think if, if there could be perhaps a statement coming out of bled from this panel, maybe we can do a bit of media attention around that, is to call a plea for that interconnectedness to be uh, a, a focus, a thematic at the conference. Otherwise, we're going to lose momentum, not gain momentum at that intersection of this very important topic. So if you all, I see nods around the room, perhaps we can get uh, some messaging out of this conference towards the water conference to say this must be on the agenda, a call for action in that sense. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you to the panelists for playing the game. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>